this morning, I want us to kind of focus on this week, uh, this Easter week, this Holy Week, this Passion Week uh, that begins today with Palm Sunday as we begin looking towards the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, and so this morning, I will look at Luke chapter 19. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I'd ask you to open there. We'll get there in just a few moments. Uh, but I want to encourage you to make plans now. I know we're a week away, but I want to encourage you to make plans now to be a part of our services next week. And if you haven't taken one of these Easter cards that's out there in the foyer, I would encourage you to take one. Next week, we're going to have an outdoor service at 7.30 in our front parking lot right out here. And I guarantee you it's going to be a special service. We have two students who are going to share their testimony. We have one of our deacons who's going to share a testimony that morning. Uh, and I just want you to come and be a part of that time, a, a part of what God's doing at Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. And then immediately after, if you come at 7.30, we're going to feed you breakfast. we got bacon biscuits and sausage biscuits, and Miss Pam's going to make cinnamon rolls. Uh, and I think we got donuts coming. I heard an amen on the cinnamon rolls, Pam, so maybe you need to make more. Uh, but there'll be plenty. Mr. Percy's going to get donuts. We're going to have coffee and all the things. So if you come at 7.30 of the service, we'll immediately have uh, breakfast after that. And then we're going to have a joint Sunday school. If you're not a part of a Sunday school or a small group, I'd encourage you to join us in the chapel next door. Uh, Mr. Kevin, uh, Brother Kevin's going to be uh, speaking during Sunday school and bringing the message. And it'll be a time of refreshment for all of our Sunday school teachers. They're not going to be teaching. They're not having to study this week. They're going to let Kevin do all of that. Uh, and so we encourage you to come to that. And then at 1030, our choir will be singing again. And we'll be talking about choosing Jesus on Easter Sunday. As we talk about the cross and what that means, we'll be talking about considering and choosing Jesus. But for today, Palm Sunday. Why is today so important? Why is Palm Sunday so important? And I want you to know that the reason today is so important is because it's the beginning of what I would consider one of the most important weeks in all of history. One of the most important weeks particularly to the Christian faith, but I would say beyond that, one of the most important weeks in all of history. Today is the beginning of Holy Week or Passion Week. And it historically marks the moment that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to proclaim his kingship so that he could make his mark on the world for eternity, so that we could have a Savior. Today is called Palm Sunday because as Jesus was riding into Jerusalem, people were waving palm branches. How many of you remember growing up? We don't really do this in church anymore, but the kids used to have palm branches and they would march in on Sunday morning and they would be waving their palm branches and they would be doing all the things and usually they would sing or do whatever. But that's what was happening. The people were waving their palm branches and they were cheering. They were waiting for the king. And palm branches were regarded as a token of joy and of triumph in this time. They were customarily used on festive occasions where kings and conquerors were welcomed. And they were welcomed with palm branches being strewn before them and waved in the air. And today, on this Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at His journey in. And we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. And more specifically, going to the title of my sermon for today, we're going to talk about the surprising nature of the kingdom of God. The surprising kingdom. Who here likes surprises? Let me see your hand. If you like surprises, let me see your hand. All across the room, we see a lot of the kiddos. There's a few adults raising their hand. But for most of us, we don't like surprises, right? I've gotten to a point in life where I don't really like surprises. I'm not good at keeping surprises. 
Uh, and so I'm not really good at doing them. You can ask Amy. I have these, in, these great anticipations of getting things and surprising the kids and surprising her, and I do a terrible job at keeping it until the moment. Like, we're getting ready for Christmas. We've got Christmas presents bought, and we're two weeks out, and I'm like, Amy, can I just give you one present? Because I want to go ahead and give it to her. The anticipation is too much. And so, honestly, I'd prefer a detailed itinerary, a perfectly scheduled and ordered Google Calendar. Uh, when we get ready to go on vacation, it drives Amy nuts because I spend hours upon hours looking at hotels and all of the things that we're going to do. And I just we've gotten to where I just have to narrow it down to a couple of things, and then we look at it, and she's like, I just can't take all of the, the stuff. Okay, I can't sit for hours and look at, at things. And so I don't really like surprises. But there are some surprises like the teasers at the end of the Marvel movies. Okay, I'm a Marvel fan. I, since I've had kids, I haven't really got to watch many of them. But always at the end of a Marvel movie, there's like at the end of the credits, you know what I'm talking about, there's a teaser for the next movie. Marvel's not the only group that does it. There's other groups that do it. But I, I like those kind of surprises. I also really like surprises and plot twists. And I think that most of us would agree that we like that. And that's why we enjoyed the series on Ruth so much, because there was that plot twist in the middle of it, and there was this story that we celebrated. And today I want us to get to spend some time looking at what I would consider one of the greatest plot twists to have ever happened in history. Today we're going to explore together how the kingdom of God is full of surprises. And so if you have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 19, I want to begin reading in verse 28, and I'll read through verse 44. And the word of the Lord says this, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the moment, at the mount that is called Mount Olive, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, and where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. I don't know about you, but I'm just kind of thinking, they don't really at this point know who the Lord is. There's not really this good explanation of what's happening. And I don't know, those of you who are farmers who may have livestock, if somebody came in and there's a livestock tied up and somebody comes in and unties it and you look at them and say, what are you doing? And they say, the Lord has need of it. Are you just going to let them walk off with it? Probably not, right? But in this moment, that's what's happening. The Lord tells them to tell them that the Lord has need of it. In verse 32, so those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they said, uh, the, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And then verse 41, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known of this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the day will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Would you pray with me this morning? God, thank you so much for today. And God, thank you for your word. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus to live on this earth. And to go through the pain and the gruel that he went through. God, to eventually get to Calvary where he died on a cross. 
where he was buried in a grave. But God, the story doesn't end there because three days later he rose from the grave victorious over life. And so, Lord, as we celebrate this Easter week, this holy week, this passion week, God, help us remember the sacrifice that you made by sending your son Jesus so that we could have eternal life. It's in your gracious and holy name we pray today. So, who here today has ever been surprised on your journey? Who here has ever been surprised or even shocked by the journey, by the path that your life has taken? Maybe you've been shocked at how God has used you, the events of your life, your suffering and your successes. I would ask you this morning, when was the last time that you were genuinely surprised by God? When you said, man, that was the Lord that did that. I wasn't expecting that. I didn't see that coming. But man, God showed up and showed out. And I think for all of us, we could probably identify a moment in life when that's happened. But what I want us to do today as we walk through this passage of Scripture is know that there are probably more moments than we can even imagine that that happens in. But so often we get so caught up in the busy day-to-day that we miss those moments. And so it's a little bit how I feel about Palm Sunday. We are surprised by what happened. Notice what verse 28 in this passage says. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. You'll notice that it says that he went up, which was symbolic to the city of God. The word Jerusalem means they will see the wholeness or they will feel the all of the completeness. You see, these are important pieces of the story and they lead us to a bigger question. And this is the question, so why was Jesus even heading to Jerusalem? Why was he going there? And the answer to that is that he was going to celebrate Passover. For those of you that may or may not know what Passover is, it was a Jewish holiday, probably the largest Jewish holiday or festival. It was a celebration of remembrance of the Exodus story when God freed the Jews from slavery in Egypt. And Passover dinner, the Last Supper, was Jesus' last meal with His disciples. Traditionally, we celebrate that on Monday, Thursday of Holy Week. Today, we're going to take communion. We're going to observe the Last Supper uh, as we think about and celebrate Jesus and remember what He did for us. So here's where it gets interesting. Jesus not only arrived in Jerusalem as the rightful King... He also came as the sacrificial lamb. John 135 says this, The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. He was proclaimed as the Lamb of God. And I want to share with you a couple of surprising facts about what happened here. We see that they talk about this Passover lamb, Jesus. He's... he's referred to as the lamb. In this day, the, the, the Passover lamb was to be chosen and to be set apart the tenth full day of the first month of Nisan. And we see this fulfilled here because on the tenth day of Nisan, Jesus rode in Jerusalem on the fowl of a donkey and was hailed as the king of the Jews. The second thing we see here is this lamb. The lamb was to be inspected for four days until the 14th day of the month for any spot or blemish. They wanted to make sure that it was perfect and that it was not disqualified as the sacrificial lamb. Jesus openly taught in the holy temple and synagogues until the 14th day of the month and no fault could be found on him. And at the appointed time, the Passover lambs were slain by the whole congregation of Israel. And we see the fulfillment of this. Jesus, the Lamb of God, 
was delivered and publicly killed on a Roman execution stake as the Passover lambs were being slaughtered. Now I want to take a, a, a look kind of at the rest of this passage of Scripture, verse by verse. I want to look at the text. I want to see the context of the text. Maybe you'll see some things, understand some things that you haven't seen before. Because we see a lot of truth come to fulfillment. We see a lot of, of things happen here. So in verses, in, in verses 29 through 30 of uh, chapter 19, I'm not going to reread all of the, the verses as we walk through, but in verses 29 through 30, we see that he's approaching Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. And he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find the colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden on. Untie it and bring it here. Now I said a moment ago that in today's society, we probably wouldn't just let the colt go. If somebody came on, we would probably try to stop them, right? But what I want us to understand is not only was it a colt, it was a colt that had never been ridden on before. It was reserved for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The king's donkey was exclusively for him, exclusively for the king and no one else. And so the Lord sent these two disciples in to get this, this donkey for him to ride on, this baby donkey, young donkey known as a colt. In verses 33 and 31 and 32, he tells them, If anyone's asking you why you're untying him, tell him that the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as they were told. They didn't just get there and have to look around for this colt. It was like right in front of them. It was just as the Lord had ordered. It was just as the Lord told them. And then he goes on in verses 33 and 34. He says, As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? To which they replied, The Lord needs it. Now this colt, as I said a moment ago, was a donkey. It's a young donkey, some baby donkey. Jesus rides the donkey now as a humble sign of peace. Later in Revelation, we see that Jesus doesn't come riding on a donkey. He comes riding on a white horse, right? And he's our ultimate Savior. But in this moment, he's riding a donkey as a sign of peace and humility. In verse 35, it says, They brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt and put it on Jesus. They understood what was happening. This colt didn't have anything for Jesus to ride on and they understood that he was the king of kings and the lord of lords and he needed not a saddle but something and so they threw their cloaks on and it was a way that they paid honor to the king. In verse 37, 38, when he came near to the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. You see, this group of traveling disciples and pilgrims rightly identify Jesus for the miracle-working Messiah that He is in that moment. And this group could see that Jesus as the Messiah was King. They noticed that He was the King that He is and that He was worthy to be praised. Verse 38, they praise His name. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory on the highest. They gave praise to his name. They acknowledged who he was. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd says, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. What did Jesus say? His response was, The people of God are praising God with their lips and the religious leaders want to shut it all down. They don't want what's happening to happen. And so they're trying everything they can, even to get Jesus to denounce what's happening. And what did Jesus say? If they don't do it, if they keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. Friends, I take this as a powerful way to say that you cannot stop what the Lord is going to do. And even if you try the very rocks themselves would cry out. You ever seen a rock cry out? Me either. But Jesus could do it if he needed to, right? That's how evident it is that the rightful king has come to Jerusalem. 
That's how many of the signs and prophecies are all pointing to Jesus entering Jerusalem as a king. And then in verse 41 and 42, he approaches Jerusalem. He saw the city. He wept over it and said, If, e- if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. In the Greek language, no means properly to know, especially through personal experience. Like they would have had some personal experience. The Pharisee couldn't perceive who Jesus was. They hadn't experienced Him. In contrast to all of the disciples who Jesus rightly recognized exactly who He was, they knew Him. They had a personal experience with Him. They knew what was happening. And then in verse 43 and 44, the day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you. They'll encircle you, hem you up on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within the walls. And they'll leave not one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of the Lord. The Romans did come and destroy Jerusalem in AD 70. Recognize the same word used before in verse 42. The painful truth is that the Pharisees and other religious leaders couldn't see it. They couldn't perceive that their Messiah was there in front of them. And this point is an important one as we consider the surprising nature of the kingdom together. There were a lot of surprising moments that happened in this story. The cult being untied, the people not acknowledging who he was, the people trying to get the story to be shut down, to get him to keep from doing it, telling him that the rocks would cry out if they didn't. Now, on one hand, as I recollect this story this morning, I I find it shocking that they couldn't see Jesus. I've had a personal experience with Jesus. I know who he is. And I, I, I... I can't imagine that they wouldn't know him, that they wouldn't acknowledge who he was. But in the culture that we live in today, there's more and more that leads us away from knowing who Jesus is. And I think that's what happened here. They didn't know him. They had not had a personal experience with him. For all of their study and their understanding of the scriptures, Jesus came riding into the city on a donkey just like Zechariah 9.9 said he would. He healed the sick. He restored the sight of the blind. He made the deaf speak, the lame walk, just as they knew the Messiah would do. In fact, just a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus did all of these things, and they couldn't see him. They couldn't know who he was. He wasn't who they expected he was going to be. They were expecting something different. But he surprised them. And I can't imagine them not understanding that. But at the same time, I realize that I'm not so different. I'm not so different in the own world. I wonder how many times Jesus has been working through some situation or offering a provision in my own life. And I just couldn't see that it was him. I couldn't see him right in front of me because I was too caught up by the distractions of the world. I was too caught up in the situation to see that God was providing for me. I was too caught up in the valley that I couldn't think about what God could be doing in the midst of it. Maybe you're here this morning and you relate to that. Maybe you felt similar tension in your own faith. And as we look back on Palm Sunday, we're able to understand what was going on. We can recognize and perceive Jesus through the events of the Holy Week, the events of Good Friday, and even Easter morning. In hindsight, we can clearly see that God's been working all along and He's been faithful and He's been true and He's never left us and He'll never forsake us. I know there are people here today who are in the the midst of painful suffering. We have a lot of people in our church family who are going through some painful stuff some health complications, some family that's having health complications. I I sat and talked with a lady this morning who was just crying because of a, a situation going on in her family. We're going through tough stuff. 
And there are others who are blinded by their own success and achievement. But we have to be careful not to lose who God is. We have to be able to recognize Him. And I want to encourage you, wherever you are today, don't get bitter. Don't harden your heart towards God. Keep your hands open and willing to, surprise, to receive the surprising kingdom of God. Be willing to have God show up in ways that we didn't expect Him to. Be open to seeing that and looking like someone or something that we couldn't imagine or perceive. He didn't look like what they thought He was going to look like. He didn't come from the lineage that they thought He was going to come from. He didn't come wearing a crown. He wasn't what they were expecting, but He was their Savior. Friends, He's right there with us today. He might not show up like we expected Him to, or asked Him to even, but He's right there, and He's always working for the good. Be careful that we don't get too bitter or frustrated. Be careful that we don't get too prideful or sure of ourselves. Be willing to receive the surprising kingdom of God. I want to give you three things as we wrap up today. Real quick. I want to give you three specific ways that I see the surprising kingdom of God at work. With encouragement to keep your hands open to the kingdom and open to receiving it as such. The first way that we see the kingdom of God at work is through people. Through people. Over in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 through 12, we have the Beatitudes. If you come on Wednesdays, we just finished a series through the Beatitudes. When we think about people who are blessed, what do we think about? Blessed are the people who live in the big house. Blessed are the people who drive the nice car. Blessed are the people who have a big retirement. Blessed are the people who have the nice job. We think about those people as being blessed. But that's not what Matthew tells us. Matthew says that blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who endure trials for theirs is the kingdom of God. It's not what we anticipate. It's not what we imagine blessing to look like. But it's the way that God surprises us. The surprising thing about it is that the people Jesus identifies as being blessed are not the usual suspects of worldly blessing. However, if the kingdom of God is an upside down one, if it's, it's, it's surprising anyway, it would make sense that the blessing looks different to us. We've got to be willing to be surprised by the various kinds of people that God is going to use in our lives. So we're surprised by the people, but also by the process. Surprised by the process. Matthew 5, 21 through chapter 7, verse 26, we see the Sermon on the Mount. And he's talking about the process, right? The, the surprising thing about the process that Jesus shares in the Sermon on the Mount is that he kind of reforms and reframes much of the Jewish teaching. We often see that the Jewish teaching is contrary to what the Sermon on the Mount says. He focuses on the heart as opposed to the end result. We've got to be willing to accept deep, divine healing as God works on our hearts. And so we're surprised by the people and the process, but finally by the plan. Many of us have plans and designs for our own lives, how they're going to be structured, how they're going to run, and at some point we all learn that our best laid plan and purposes are nothing compared to the surpassing greatness of God. The surpassing greatness of knowing Christ and living holy for Him. Friends, if we build our lives on anything else, we will falter and possibly even fail because Christ is the only solid, firm foundation that we all need and we must be willing to humble ourselves, relinquish our plans to His plans. You may be surprised by God in ways when He's leading your life, where He leads you. And so friends, we see this surprise. We see the surprise in the story of the triumphal entry. It wasn't what was expected, but it's what happened. We see it all throughout Scripture. And I want to leave us with this last verse from Lamentations chapter 3. 
It says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercy never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. Friends, every morning sunrise brings new mercy. Every morning sunrise brings surprises. It brings fresh grace and the daily reminder that God's love is unfailing for all of His creation. Are you willing to be surprised by God this week? Will you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for today and for the opportunity that we've had to be in your house and to worship your holy name, God. Lord, I pray, God, that we would be a people who are willing to be surprised. God, maybe we walked into this place this morning and we said, I'm just going to go to church. I'm going to go to Sunday school. I'm going to sing the songs. I'm going to listen to Pastor Chris preach a sermon and then I'm going to go home. But friend, does God want to surprise you this morning? Does God want to change something about that? Does He want to make the the mundane, the normal, not so normal? Does He want to work in your life in a special way today? In just a few moments, we're going to take communion. At Mount Pisgah Baptist Church, we believe that communion is for believers, people who have put their faith and trust in Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. You've never put your hope in Him. You've never given your life to Him. Friend, if that's you, I'd love to talk to you more about the saving grace that is offered to us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus on the cross. Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, Well, Pastor Chris, I've done that. But I've been called up by all of the stuff in life that I don't get surprised by God. Because I'm too distracted to see the surprises. Friend, if that's you, this altar will be open. Whatever your prayer posture is, you can pray right where you are. You can come down front. Maybe you don't even want to make it known publicly today, but there's a card in the pew. and I'd love for you to take that out and fill it out and drop it in the offering plate to let us know that you've given your heart to the Lord or you've rededicated your heart to Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been looking for a church family to bind with and do this journey of life that God's called us to. I'd love to talk to you more about that as well. Whatever God is calling you to, though, even if it's surprising, open your heart and experience Him today. In just a few moments, we're going to sing a song and We're going to move into a time of communion. For the next few minutes, I just want you to sing this song and prepare yourself to celebrate the risen Savior. Lord, we thank you so much for today and the opportunity that we've had to be here. It's in your gracious and loving heavenly name we pray today.